it's a privilege for me to be here with you tonight and to come and be able to see all your smiling faces. I know that I saw some of you last year. And so for me, it kind of feels like coming back to see old friends. You know how it is when you get together with friends you haven't seen in a while and you just kind of pick up from the place that you left off the last time. And, um, and you know, and what better chorus to come off of we believe, you know, we believe that God brings life from the dead. And so for me to be able to come tonight and to share about the way that I've seen God write his redemption story across the pages of my life is a joy for me. But it's not that the story has been completely written. You know, he's not finished yet. And so tonight I am going to tell you some of my testimony that I have shared last year, hopefully in a little bit different way, so that if you've heard me share last year, you won't be sitting here thinking, oh yeah, I heard that before. But I also want to tell you part of the he's not finished yet, what we've seen the Lord do in the past year since the time that we spent together, and also, you know, what he continues to put on our heart for the days ahead, both for me and for my family, you know, to know that, that he's not finished wherever we find ourselves. And in the past couple of weeks, the Lord has had my heart in, in the book of Haggai, and I know it's kind of like this random obscure book that seems to land itself right towards the end of the, the Old Testament. You know, you're like just a couple pages away from the New Testament here, and, it, and it's just this little tiny book in these two little chapters, but I want to set the stage for tonight by taking you into those two chapters and, and then weave the night around that. So we see this message, these two chapters, recorded about 18 years after they returned from their exile, and he would have been about 70 years old. I like to get a little bit of the history, you know, enough to kind of place some reference. And in this first chapter, Haggai is talking to the people because he's saying, you know, we need to rebuild the temple. You need to rebuild the temple. The Lord had asked them to rebuild the temple. And, and the people came, when they came back from the exile, um, it didn't quite go the way they thought, and they faced a lot of discouragement, and so they found themselves receiving this word from him in this place of vulnerability. And I think we can all relate with that place of vulnerability. They had been humbled by the exile, they were hopeful when they returned, and then they were discouraged by the opposition that they faced in rebuilding the temple. But he's coming to them and he's saying to them, you know, consider your ways. Consider what the Lord has had asked you to do. Consider what has yet to be done. Consider the Lord and who he is. And I think we all find ourselves in that position where we say, okay, I need to take a minute and think about this. I need to think about what God has asked me to do. I need to think about what God is asking me to do right now. Whether it's a dream that he's laid on my heart or whether it's circumstances that I find myself needing to walk through, okay, I'm going to consider my ways and consider the importance of every choice that I make. And he, and he goes through this first chapter talking to them about that. And talking to them about what they've seen happen in their lives and what hasn't gone the way they thought and the importance of rebuilding the temple. And then he gives them this message of encouragement in the second chapter. And what I love about this is that I think this so identifies with the heart of the Lord. When he puts a call on our life, when he asks us to do something for, for him and with him, he doesn't just leave us in this place where he says, here's what I want you to do, let me know when you finish it and we'll move on. He says, I'm going to be there to walk this out with you. And so he gives them this message of encouragement in the second chapter. And as we move through that, and I'm not going to read it all for you tonight, and I hope that you feel inspired to go home and study it on your own. In chapter 2, verse 9, he says, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. You know, and I'm sure that they were all thinking about the days of the temple and all of its majesty before. And thinking, you know, hopefully we can come to this place where life looks that beautiful. And I don't know if you've ever felt that way about your life. When you kind of look back over it and you think, wow, wasn't it beautiful back then? Didn't I love what God was doing in my life then? I, I want it to at least look that good. But Haggai makes this promise to them that the Lord gives him. He's speaking as the mouthpiece of the Lord, and he's saying, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace. Wow, doesn't that just inspire you for what God has coming? 
wherever you are in this next season of your life, that I can look back on my life and say, God, in the amazing way that you brought redemption over my family, in the amazing way that you walked through all of, all of everything with us, you have more planned. He is a God who never stops creating, and he hasn't finished with us yet. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a wife and a mom. Those were the two main goals of my life. When I was a little girl in kindergarten or first grade, I wanted to be an astronaut. I was afraid of heights. I don't get how those two things combined. It didn't last very long, and I kind of settled into that thing of, you know, I can't wait until I'm a grown-up, until I am a wife and a mom, and I have a family of my own. I loved family. I loved the family that God had placed me in, you know, the family that he had given me, and I looked forward to the day that I would have my own. When I was growing up, I was a very shy girl. You would not have caught me front and center of anything. I did not want to have anyone's attention directed at me. I wanted to do a good job in whatever I was doing, but I didn't want to stand out for any reason. But God has done this transformation in my life to bring me to this place where I love this. I love the opportunity to testify of who he is, of the love that he pours over our lives and into our hearts and the way that he brings redemption. You know, when I was growing up, I don't think I really knew who God had created me to be. I knew that he laid this passion inside of me to be a wife and a mom, but I didn't get all these other things. And I guess maybe I'm kind of a late bloomer in finding some of this out, you know, in the... I'm hoping this isn't the latter stage of my life. Uh, but, you know, learning new things about myself discovering new things that God had placed inside of me. I don't think that these are new things at all. I think it's just things I hadn't looked for then. I don't think I had the courage to look for things like this back when I was in elementary school and middle school and high school. I wanted to be a wife and a mom. I met Charlie when I was in high school. We got engaged my senior year, which I thought was great. You know, I was doing exactly what God had put in my heart to do. But let me tell you, now that I have a daughter who was a junior in high school, I'm like, that was a terrible idea. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> go to college, see the world, you know, go on mission trips, do whatever you want. Uh, wait a little bit longer to get married. <laughs> now that I'm a mom, look, you know, I see things differently. Um, but I got married the fall after I graduated from high school. I had met Charlie at church. He was a few years older than I was. We were both looking forward to the day when we would have our own family. And so we were overjoyed in that first year of marriage to find out that we were expecting. It was like, okay, my life can be anything I want it to be. It's all going according to plan. Check mark number one on the list, I'm a wife. Check mark number two, we're going to have a baby. What could be better? It was as if, you know, life was going to be this great big blank canvas and I could paint it any way I wanted. But life doesn't always work that way. It doesn't always meet our expectations. And at 26 weeks of pregnancy, we lost our daughter. She was born premature and she only lived for 20 minutes. And for me, I hadn't ever experienced anything like that before. I hadn't known great personal loss and trauma. And while I had a foundation of faith to stand on, I was coming back to this place of saying, God, I don't understand. I don't understand why this thing that you've allowed me to dream about my entire life, I don't, allow why, I don't know why you've allowed that to be taken. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. I don't get what this is supposed to look like. And so for me, it was this season of wrestling with the Lord to understand that because I knew that God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was the same God that I had read about in the pages of the Word. And I knew the stories that I had read weren't just stories. They were real people and real people's lives. And he had walked with them and he had worked this out. But I said, God, I don't get it. And I need to understand how to trust you when my circumstances don't look like what I wanted. And I knew in that season of my life, more than anything, that I did not trust God. And I thought, God, how could I have walked with you for all these years and come to this place where I honestly know that I don't trust you? And I know it's not you. I know that you're not the one with the problem. I know it's me. I'm the problem. And you must be so disappointed in me that I'm here in this place today saying, God, I don't trust you. 
But I felt like he was saying, you know what, Marie, I'm not disappointed with you because I have been waiting your whole life for you to get to this place where you knew you didn't trust me. Because when you realized it, then we could do something about it. And I said, okay, God, but I don't really know how this works. How do I learn to trust you if I haven't gotten that all these years? And I was frustrated with myself because I knew it wasn't going to be this overnight change. It wasn't going to be something that was fixed quickly. You know, it's kind of like when you're on a diet and you just need to lose that last five pounds. And it's not going anywhere. That's how I felt about this whole thing of learning to trust the Lord. God, every day I get up and I'm the same and nothing's changing. But I felt like he was saying, stop being so concerned with seeing some kind of change and just allow me to have access to your heart. And I knew that I had to be willing to let go of all these things that I'd held so tightly. To let go of this dream of being a mom in the way that I wanted it to look. It was asking me to let it go. And it really wasn't an easy process. And it wasn't like one day I didn't trust him and one day I did. It was just this gradual progression of allowing him a little bit deeper into my heart day after day after day. Until finally one day I could look back and say, I think you're doing something. I think something might be changing. And he's patient like that. He is patient. He doesn't push us past where we're ready to go. He allows us to walk with him hand in hand at as slow of a pace as we need. And so in this season, I was discovering how to trust him, discovering how to say, God, whatever it is that you place in my path today, I'm going to find joy in it because I'm going to find you in it. And I need to find my joy in you and not my circumstance. Not what I thought I wanted life to look like all along, but just simply in who you are and what you've placed in my day. And it began this journey of discovery, this journey of discovery of trusting the Lord when my circumstances didn't look like what I wanted. And, you know, it's easy for me to stand here and say that, um, you know, nine years later and say, I can see the way that God led me in that season. I can see the way that he knew I was going to need that down the road. You know how it is. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. But that's the kind of God he is, that he's gracious and he uses everything. He uses every moment in our lives because I can't imagine walking through the circumstances of October 2nd, 2006, saying, God, I don't trust you. He knew that I was going to come to this place in my life where I had to trust him. This place where we, we couldn't be dealing with this issue of trust. I was going to be in this moment where I had to make a choice to trust him. <laughs> And it's like this little trail of Hansel and Gretel crumbs that leads me right back to him. Because we have all these moments in our lives that just seem insignificant. All of those days that I was pursuing the Lord on trying to understand what it means to trust him and to let go of my expectations, let go of my type A personality list, those days felt insignificant. They felt like nothing mattered, but they, they amounted into this place of change where he changed my heart. I didn't know it was happening, but it didn't mean that he wasn't faithfully doing it that whole time. And he does that with those ordinary moments of our lives that don't look like anything, and he uses them to become something that we didn't know we were going to need down the road, because he is a good and faithful father. I don't think that anything is coincidence, and I don't think he wastes one second of our lives. He uses it all. He redeems it all. In the years after that first loss, losing our daughter Elise, we had a second loss. And then we found out that we were pregnant a few months after that. 
And that time I knew that it was going to be different. The Lord had given me this promise that he was going to give me a daughter named Abigail. And I knew that this time was different. I knew this was going to be it. And so as we walked through that pregnancy, again, it brought me to this place of, okay, God, I want to trust you because all I know is loss. I don't know what it feels like to get to the end of 40 weeks and come home with this beautiful baby in your arms. I don't know that. I only know the disappointment. But I don't want to expect more disappointment. I just want to trust you. And he showed me how to live that out too. And Abigail was born on her due date, 40 weeks. Everything was perfect. And I thought, God, this is exactly what I've always asked you for. Two years later, we had Bryce. And a couple years after that, we had Carson. And you know, it wasn't like every day was this mountaintop experience. And all those years that I had spent dreaming about being a wife and mom, I failed to realize the challenges of that. But I knew that God had given me what I'd asked him for. I knew that he had answered the cries of my heart. And while each day wasn't perfect, I was thankful for the opportunity to experience those days. You know, for me, the Lord had really healed that ache, that loss. It wasn't that I still didn't think about what would life be like had Elise not been born early. Of course I thought about that. And there were times that it stung deeply. But I knew that he is a God of redemption and that he was still redeeming it and I could still trust him. And he had really brought that healing about in my heart to be able to honestly say those words, to say, God, I trust you. I know that you're doing something beautiful that I'm probably not aware of. And while I might not ever know the truth of what you have planned and why you allowed this in my life, I know that you see my heart. I know that you know exactly where I am and I know you hear my cries. And I can trust you with this life. But Charlie had not reached that place of allowing the Lord to heal his heart. And so when he went into the schoolhouse on October 2nd, 2006, he went with the anger and bitterness towards the Lord for the loss of our daughter, Elise. He called me that morning. It was a beautiful autumn day, you know, beautiful sunshine. The leaves were just starting to change on the trees. The breeze was warm. It was beautiful. There was nothing that could allude to what would happen He called me later that morning and he said, Marie, I'm not coming home. And I could tell by the sound of his voice that he meant what he said and I would never see him again. But at that moment, I didn't know what was happening. And so, you know, I'm hearing his words and hearing him say things that don't really make sense and that weren't giving me any sense of what was happening. But on the other hand, I'm thinking about the promises that we'd made to each other. The promises that we made on our wedding day. The promises that we had made as parents to our children, I'm thinking, God, how on earth can any of this be possible? And I pleaded with him, Charlie, please don't do whatever you're planning to do. And my pleas went unanswered. And at the end of the conversation, he said, I left a letter for you on the dresser, and please tell my parents, tell the kids that I love them. And he hung up the phone. And as I went to the dresser and I retrieved the letter and I read it, I thought, you know, I've never read a suicide note, but I'm sure that this must be one. And so I called 911 thinking maybe something, some little bit of information that he gave, maybe it can help stop whatever he had planned. But it was obvious to me that they knew a lot more than I did. I could tell by their questions that they had information that they weren't sharing with me. And as we hung up the phone, the operator and I, I was hearing the sound of sirens from our fire department in town and the helicopters that were flying overhead and the police cars that were going up the street. And I knew that it was all related. I knew that all of these circumstances went together. And in the pit of my stomach, I felt it deeply. And I wanted to cry out to the Lord with a prayer that seemed like it mattered. But all I could say was, God, help God, whatever is going on, help. And I knew that I didn't have to say anything. I knew that he heard my heart, and I knew that he saw the circumstances. It wasn't long until the police were at my door, and I said to them, it's Charlie, isn't it? And they said, yes. And I said, and he's dead, isn't he? And they said, yes. 
And they came in and asked me questions and told me things that no one would want to hear. And I thought, how is it possible that the man that walked his kids to the bus stop that morning, that kissed them and hugged them and said, I love you, how is this possible? And you know, with everything inside of me, I would have wanted to deny that this was true, except that it was staring me right in the face and there was no way that I could deny any of it. I stood in my living room that afternoon after, de after the detectives had gone, one had waited with me. I knew that I had to leave my home. I wasn't really sure where I was going to go at that point to my parents' house for the afternoon, but after that, I didn't know. But I knew the media was coming, and I said to the officer, how much time do you think I have before they come? And he said, I'm surprised they're not already here. But I stood in my living room and I said, okay, God, I know that I have to make a choice. I have to make a choice about what I'm going to choose to believe about my life from today forward. And there are only two choices. I can either choose to believe that you are who you say you are, that you are everything I've ever read in the Word, and you are everything that you've ever spoken into my heart. I can choose to believe that somehow you're going to come and rescue us. Or I can choose to believe that we're going down like the fastest sinking ship. But there are only two choices, and I have to make one. And I said, God, I don't really know what you can do with any of this. I can't see my way through it at all. I know that I have nothing. I'm desperate. I've got nothing. But I know that I have nothing to lose by trusting you. There is nothing to lose by trusting you. So God, I trust you. And whatever you can do with this, do it. Not just for me, not just for my family, but for the Amish families, for the first responders, for everyone that's touched by this. God, whatever you can do in all of this, do it. And he did. And you know, I don't think that the Lord needed my permission to do any of the things that he had planned to do in my life, but I don't think I would have seen them had I not asked him. Because I believe that by asking him to do something and telling him that I trusted him, it enabled my heart to see what he would do. Because it's all about perspective. It's all about perspective. If I would have chosen to believe that my life was over, it probably would have been. And not because the Lord wouldn't have intervened, but because I would have already chosen not to see it. Our lives are all about perspective. It's about what we're going to choose to believe in. It's not easy to make that choice to trust him. Because trusting him requires faith, and faith requires everything. Taking a leap of faith is not easy. Once you're in the air, it's no problem. It's that initial launch that's hard. Because we weigh the cost of everything that we know in this world. But he's not of this world. And our ability to trust him shouldn't be based on the circumstances that we can conceive. But it should be based on the perspective of God. I know that you love me. And I know that you are capable of working out things that I can't see my way through. God, I know what the word says. I know that it says that you are close to the brokenhearted. I know that you see my brokenness. God, I can trust you. It's not that I was a giant of faith. It's just that he led me, he led me and he led my heart to take that leap. To say, God, I would rather risk trusting you and take this leap than stay where I am. I would rather risk it than stay here. Because that's what it meant to say my life is over, to stay here and not risk the faith to say, you can do something that I can't see. Because he can. He is a God of redemption. There are so many stories of redemption through the word. And they're not just stories, they're people's lives that were lived out. And they're not just to inspire us, but they're to enable us to choose to believe that he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. That if he was capable of doing what he did in the life of Esther, to walk 
life out with Ruth, to call David a man after his own heart. If he could do all of those things then, he can still do those things now. It's this place of faith to say, God, I trust you. And it's the same thing that we see in Haggai, that when he asks us to do something, he encourages us with his presence, and he walks it out with us. I've never felt the presence of the Lord more strongly than I did that day. He was with me. He was truly with me. That day was one that was filled with many difficult choices, but also I can look back on it and say that it was filled with the presence of the Lord. We went to my parents' house that afternoon. My kids were in their backyard playing with my mom and dad. The windows were open and I could hear the sounds of their laughter blowing in with the breeze. At that point, the kids didn't know what had happened. And I was sitting there in my parents' living room saying to the Lord, you have got to fix this. You have to fix this because this was not supposed to be their life. They were not supposed to know tragedy and heartache like this and you have to fix it because I can't. And I felt him say to me, you know what, Marie, I am not going to fix it, but I am going to redeem it. And it took the fear away from me. It took away the fear of thinking, what is going to happen when I tell them the truth of what took place today? I wasn't afraid anymore to say the words that I needed to tell them. I knew that it wouldn't be easy, but I knew that if God had made me a promise that he would keep it. And you know, I don't know how many millions of people have lived on this earth since Adam and Eve. And how many millions of prayers have been prayed. But you know, God hasn't missed any of them. And every promise he's ever made, he's kept. To, to everyone, forever. It doesn't mean that it always looks like what we thought, but every promise he's ever made, he's kept. I think about that and it blows my mind because I know how much I love my kids. I love them and I would do anything for them anytime, day or night. But I know that even in my best intentions, there have been things I've missed. Things that I don't even know I missed. I'm sure that you, if you asked any one of my children, they could tell you times that I forgot things. Probably this week. But God hasn't ever forgotten anything. And he's not missed it. He loves us like that. And I knew that if he was telling me that he was going to redeem this, that he would. And so I simply called the kids in and Abigail sat on one side, Bryce on the other, and Carson on my lap. They were seven, five, and a year and a half. And I just simply said, today your dad made some very bad choices. Some people got hurt and some people died, and he died too. And I knew that they needed to know the truth of what had happened. I knew, I knew that they had to know everything before they went back to school because I couldn't risk them hearing something on the playground thinking this could not possibly be true and finding out that it was. But I knew that they didn't need to know it all at once. They didn't need to hear everything all at the same time, and I knew that this was enough. And so we sat there in the sorrow of that moment, but also in the moment of knowing that God had made a promise over it. And it wasn't my responsibility to fix it. When I said, God, I need you to fix it, he didn't say, Marie, I'm going to have you fix it instead. And I think that as a parent, it's so easy to take on that responsibility of, I have to fix this. I need to fix this. Because we want to fix it. I mean, we don't like to see our kids struggling. We don't want to see them suffering. But God promises us that he's going to redeem it. And just like I don't want to see my kids struggle and suffer, I know that he doesn't like to see us that way either. And if it breaks my heart when my kids are going through something difficult, how much more does it break God's heart when he sees us struggling? He loves us far more than we will ever know. But every day is another opportunity to discover just a little bit about that. You know that 
that day was filled with so many difficult places. I was sitting in my parents' kitchen and I was trying to write out a statement our pastor had offered to be my spokesperson for the media. And I was thinking, what could I possibly say? What could I say in the light of all of this? One of my mom's friends came in the kitchen and she said to me, hey Marie, how's it going? And I said, I can't do this. And I meant, I can't write this statement, but I also meant, I cannot do this. I can't do this life. How am I supposed to walk through this and find healing for my brokenness? How am I supposed to help my kids walk through this? How can I carry the weight of knowing all of the brokenness that everyone else has experienced too? I can't do this. And she said to me, you know what, Marie? I don't think this has ever been done before, and whatever choice you make will be the right one. And she couldn't have possibly known in that moment how significant those words would be to me. But I really don't think that there's been a day that's gone by in the past nine years that I haven't thought about how much that meant. I didn't have to fix it. It was one more time that the Lord was saying, it's not your responsibility to fix this. I knew that I didn't have to make perfect choices. That if God had promised redemption, he was going to redeem it all. And the most important thing was to keep my heart going after his. But not to always be concerned, am I making all the right choices? You see, before that, I had been a perfectionist. I wanted everything perfect all the time. When I was a kid, I didn't raise my hand in class. Even if I was 99% certain I knew the answer, you know, there was that 1% chance I could be wrong. I wanted it to be perfect. But even in these hard moments, he was bringing redemption in a new place in my life to say, Marie, you can let go of that. I'm not concerned with perfection. I am concerned with redemption. You see, when God makes a promise of redemption, he wasn't just making this promise of, okay, I'm going to redeem these circumstances in this place that you didn't choose to walk. I'm going to bring redemption over this. He wasn't just saying that. He's saying, I'm going to bring redemption. And it's not just going to touch one corner of your life, but it's going to cover everything. And that's the beauty of God. But it is this multifaceted, multidimensional process that touches everything. And it's not just confined to one moment, but it changes the course of our lives forever. Because he hasn't just brought healing for me over the choices that Charlie made, but he wanted to bring healing to my heart for things like all those years that I thought I couldn't be wrong. Because he loves me like that. And you know, he didn't choose to love me because he felt sorry for me for these circumstances or because he thought I was special. He chose to love me because I'm his child and I'm the same as you. And if he chose to love me like this, he wants to love you like this too. He didn't do any of this for me because of any other reason. He did it because he loves me. And the redemption plan that he has for your life, he's doing it because he loves you too. There is nothing you could do to make him love you more. And there is nothing you can do to make him love you less. He just loves you. And his love for us is not seen in our circumstances, but it's seen in the way that he chooses to walk that out with us. You know, people ask me all the time, why do you think he allows bad things to happen? And I don't really have a good answer for you except for that we live in a fallen world and everybody makes choices. You know, we're not robots. We make choices. And sometimes we walk out the aftermath of someone else's bad choice and sometimes we walk out the aftermath of our own. But even in all of those places, God's plan has always been redemption. It doesn't change. His, his plan, his strategy is always the same. He's going to redeem it. And there were so many moments of that day where I saw that plan of redemption unfold before my very eyes. Later that afternoon, I was looking out the window in my parents' kitchen kind of thinking, how can this be happening, you know? Feeling the weight of all of it so heavily. 
how could I have woken up this morning? I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm a wife. You know, we have these three beautiful children, and no, life isn't always easy, but by all intents and purposes, it's relatively normal. How can, how can I go from that to this in the span of a few hours? As I looked out the window, I saw these Amish men walking down the street, and I knew they were coming to my parents' house. This was the community that I had grown up in. We knew each other. We were not strangers. And I knew they were coming here. And I thought, I have no idea what to say to them. What could I possibly say in light of all that they've faced today? So I said to my parents, what do I do? You know, what, what do I say? I don't know. I don't know what to do. And my dad said, it's okay, Marie. You can stay inside, and I'll go out and talk with them. And so I watched from the window, and I couldn't hear what was spoken, but I could see everything. I saw the way that they put their hand on his shoulder. I saw the way that they embraced one another, the tears that flowed down everyone's faces. And as he came inside, we all waited for him to collect himself from the emotion of that moment, and he said, Marie, they came because they were concerned about you. They were concerned about the kids, and they wanted you to know that they had forgiven Charlie, and they were extending grace and compassion to your family. And you know, of all the things that were running through my mind as I saw them walking down the street and all the demands they could have made and the questions they could have asked me, they didn't come to get anything. But they came instead to, gift, to give something. They came to give this gift of extending forgiveness over Charlie and of telling me that. And so many people ask me, how has their extension of forgiveness and grace and compassion impacted you? And I don't even think I have words to describe that. Because before I ever had a time to really soak in, you know, it had been a matter of a few hours that I was just responding to one thing after another. I hadn't had this any span of quiet time to even soak in all of what they had faced, all of the loss that they had experienced, and feel the weight of that. They came... They came. And you know, I think it's so easy to think that forgiveness is about having someone come to you and say, hey, you know, I want you to know that I'm sorry. I knew that I hurt your feelings and I, I want to apologize for that. I think it's easy, you know, for me to think that that's what forgiveness is. And I think that that's probably what I thought for a very long time until this day. But one thing that I have absolutely seen in their actions and their choice to forgive Charlie is that forgiveness is not about the other person. It's not. Because their choosing to forgive Charlie was going to do nothing for him. It wasn't going to make a difference for him at all. My choosing to forgive Charlie was not going to do something for Charlie. My choosing to forgive Charlie was going to do something for me. Because when we come to the Lord and we say, okay, God, my heart is broken because I've experienced something that totally devastated me, someone that I thought I could trust, they have broken me. When we come and pour that out before the Lord, he wants it. He wants to take our burdens. You know, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wants what we're carrying. And when we lay it down, it gives us the opportunity to receive what he wants to pour into us. It gives us the opportunity to receive the grace and the healing that God wants to give. And it's not saying that what the other person did didn't matter. It wasn't saying that Charlie's choices had no effect. It wasn't saying that I was letting him off the hook for that or anything. That's not what it was about. It was simply saying, God, I am choosing to forgive him. I want to let go of this, and I want you to fill me instead. And it's not an easy choice, and it's often forgiveness is not something that happens in one solitary moment. I think that our hearts are a lot like onions, and it's just this process of one layer at a time. One small layer at a time. And God understands that, and he understands that we come back to him time and time again for the same thing. And he's not sitting up there saying, Marie, what is your problem? You and I just talked about this yesterday. He's saying, come, pour it out before me, lay it at my feet, and let me fill you with something. 
And I think that that's what worship is. It's this place of great exchange where we can lay down whatever it is that we're carrying and take on what he gives us. Beauty for ashes, a spirit of praise for a garment of heaviness. It's this great exchange that we see because of Christ's choice. His, his choice to die in our place. We have the opportunity to make this great exchange. And you know, for me, when I look back on that time in my life, and I can see the devastation, and I can see the beauty of God, people say to me, you know, how does it feel year after year to go through the anniversaries? You know, does it change the way that you feel? And I say no, because I still feel the sorrow. I still know the loss. But yes, because I take an inventory of what the Lord has done. Because I don't want the darkness to win. I don't want that day to be a day that's solely defined by darkness. I want it to be a day that's overcome with the light. To say, God, I know that we face some very hard circumstances, and I know that a lot of other people faced great difficulty and excruciating pain that day, but here is what you've done in the midst of that. Because you are a good God who loves his children. Because you won't ask us to walk someplace that you won't go with us. You won't ask me to do something that you won't do with me. Whatever he asks us to walk through, whatever he asks us to do, he's going to do with us. And I felt him with me in all of those days. We spent that first week at my aunt and uncle's house. They lived about 45 minutes from where I did, and they had asked the children and I to come and stay with them for the week. And when we came home, I said to the Lord, Okay, God, so now I need to do all this stuff by myself. Of all the things I ever thought I'd be, I'd never thought I'd be a single mom. And being a single mom is much more hard than you can imagine until you have to do it. Because you're doing it all by yourself. Except that the Lord was showing me that I wasn't doing anything by myself because he was always with me if I would allow him to be. If I would allow him to show me that he was right there. Because, you know, it's so easy to get wrapped up in my list of here's what I have to do and here's what's next and here's what I need to be out the door that I forget to let him be there with me. And it becomes this process of saying, okay, God, I don't want to be so consumed about my list that I forget all about you. But show me how you're going to walk this out with me because I can't do this by myself. And I think in those moments of my life, I learned that having this place of desperation really isn't that bad of a thing. Because when I am desperate and I know that I can't do this on my own, I see God show up. And it's not that he's not going to show up all those other days. It's just that I forget to look for him. And I want to live my life like I'm desperate. I want to live it like I can't do any of this on my own because I want to see him partnering with me. I want to see the way that he leads me through. And when we came back to our house that very first night, I said, okay, God, I know I'm going to miss a lot of things. I know myself. I'm going to forget library books and show and tell and all that stuff. But I don't want to miss an opportunity to connect my kids to who you are because I don't want this to just be my journey. I don't want this to just be my story. I want this to be about you and the way that you walked us through all of it. But I really don't get how to do that with these circumstances. How do I take this and make something out of it? And he didn't answer me quite like I thought he would. I felt him say to me, Marie, do you remember when you were a little girl and you went to the Methodist street, the church up the street, and you had Bible school there? Do you remember the scavenger hunt that you went on at that church? And I said, oh yes, I will never forget that scavenger hunt. I was probably five or six, and we started with this one little clue, and it took us to somewhere inside the church as we figured out you know, the answer to that clue. And when we arrived there, we received another clue, and it took us somewhere else in the church. And so it was just this series of, you know, one clue after another. And we knew that when we got to the end, there would be a prize. But you never knew if you were going to find a clue or if this would be when you found the prize. 
And to me, thinking about it, you know, it felt like we were doing this for hours, you know, this great adventure, and it was probably maybe like 20 minutes. But I never forgot how it felt to be so excited about something and looking for it. The prize that we received was this little angel Christmas ornament, and I still put it on my tree every year. And I said, oh God, of course I remember that. And I felt him say to me, Marie, that's how I want you to look at your life. I want you to look at life as if you're on this amazing scavenger hunt with me, and when you least expect it, there I'll be. It might be a clue that reminds you of how much I love you, or it might be a prize, but this is an adventure. And I said, God, that's not how I would look at my life right now. I can, honestly can't tell you any moment in my life where my natural inclination would be to say, yes, God, we are on this amazing adventure, and won't this be fun? You know, I just don't think I live like that in a natural state. But I felt him inspiring my heart to do that now. In the midst of these circumstances that did not look at all like an adventure to say, God, we are on this amazing adventure, and I know that you're going to show up. But we did, and he did. Around every corner, there he was. Whether it was his presence or an expression of love from a neighbor, whether it was a card that we see, received from someone around the world saying, I'm praying for you, I'm believing that God is going to do good things in your life. It was the scavenger hunt. I want to live my life like I'm on a scavenger hunt. Because isn't that far more fun than just saying, okay, it's 6.30 on Tuesday morning, and this is what I have to do today. To say, God, I know that you have an amazing adventure for me, and I know that if I'm looking for you today, I'm going to see you. And does that mean that every day is wildly fun and exciting? <laughs> no. <laughs> But it's a choice. It's a choice to look for him in the midst of all of the things that seem mundane and inconsequential and all of the things that are inconvenient to find him anyway. Last spring, he kind of reminded me of this in a really huge way. I'm, I'm a bird person. I mean, I don't really know birds, but I like them. I, you know, I can identify the basics like robins and blue jays and all that stuff. But throughout the past few years, the Lord has just reminded me of his presence in feathers. You know, I particularly love Psalm 91. He talks about how he's going to cover us under the shelter of his wings. And so sometimes I'll just find these little random feathers, and I feel like it's God's reminder to me that he is faithful and that he is doing just that. And sometimes the feathers are so fine, I just don't even know where they came from, but they're just there. Well, I'd been asking the Lord for, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years to see an eagle. I wanted to see a bald eagle. I live in Lancaster County. People talk about seeing bald eagles all the time. I didn't want to see one in the zoo. I wanted to see a real bald eagle flying in the sky. And I ask him about this a lot, and I have this expectation that he's going to do it. And so every time I see a big bird, you know, flapping its wings up in the sky, I kind of look like, oh, is that a bald eagle? No, it's just some kind of hawk or a buzzard, and it is not exciting. <clears throat> well, last spring, there was one day that uh, my, one of my boys was going out the door, and uh, he's not always the best at having all of his stuff together. And I said... Don't you have gym today? Don't you need your gym bag? No, no, gym's not today. I don't have gym. I'm like, okay. He gets to school, and about five minutes later, he texts me. Hey, Mom, I have gym today. I need my gym bag. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, I'm leaving now to take your other brother to school, so I'll bring it later. What time do you have gym? And he said, I think it's at 9.50. I mean, it's the middle of the school year. I'm not sure how you don't know, but okay. I said, all right, I'll, I'll get back to you when I get home. So then I'm barely home from taking my younger son to school, and I get this text, hey, Mom, I have gym in five minutes. I need you to bring me my gym bag right now. <laughs> okay, we live five minutes from school. Hey, no problem. But I wasn't super excited about it. I was like, man, you know, I asked him if he needed the gym bag. But I drove 
to school and I got stuck in the elementary line and it was, it was way more than five minutes and so I go into the office and I'm saying, hey, you need to call my son down for his gym bag. Like, he's in gym right now and he can't participate, but I don't want him to get a zero for the day, especially since I'm here with his bag. Could you please just call him down? So they call him down and I get stuck in the elementary traffic on the way out through and, and so this, you know, five minute trip to school turned into like this 25 minute ordeal. And I pull into our neighborhood and I see this bird in the sky and I'm like, all right, maybe it's an eagle. And I look up and oh my goodness, it was a bald eagle. And I thought, God, you know, here I am thinking, this is a little bit of an inconvenience and if he would have just taken the gym bag as I asked him, I wouldn't have wasted almost the past half hour running around with this thing. But I would never have seen this bald eagle. You use everything. Even when I don't think you're going to do it. You know, I wasn't driving to school and coming home thinking, wow, this just might be the day that after 10 or 15 years, God answers my cry to see a bald eagle. <laughs> but he's faithful like that and he does it anyway. He does surprising things in our lives. After losing Charlie, I said to the Lord, you know, God, I loved being a wife. You know that I loved being a wife. But Jesus, if it's just you and me from now till forever, I get that because I can't imagine that there's a man on the face of this earth that wants to handle what my life looks like now. However, if there is some guy, just bring me one because I'm not dating. And I kind of tucked that away, but at Christmas that year, Bryce said to me, Hey, Mom, could you get me a new dad for Christmas? And I said, Bryce, it's not like going to the grocery store and buying a box of cereal. You can't just pick one. And so he starts to go through his little five-year-old expectation of, Well, he'd have to love you, and we'd have to love him, and he'd have to love God. But I said, Okay, God, every child needs a mom and a dad, and my kids need a dad more now than ever before. And I don't really know what this would look like, but I trust you. And you know, there's so many times in my life where I've said, God, I don't really know what this is going to look like, but I trust you. And it brings me back to that place of after that loss of Elise, having to come to terms with the fact that I didn't trust him. And allowing God to walk me through a new season of learning how to trust him. And I do not think that he allowed me to lose Elise to teach me how to trust him. I don't think that at all. But I think that that's one of the ways that I can see the redemption over that. Because he knew I was going to need it in so many ways. And he did bring this really wonderful man, Dan, into my life. Not just for me, but for my kids. If it was about me, I wouldn't have ever probably chosen to date someone and to get married. But I knew that my kids needed a dad. And God works in unexpected, you know, surprising kinds of ways. We've been married just about eight and a half years. And when we first got married, the kids ranged in age from like two to 15. And as Dan and I started talking about our family and all of that, I said, you know, I don't really see us having more children biologically, but I do think that the Lord is going to call us to adopt one day. And, and he would say the same thing every time I brought this up. He'd say, um, have you forgotten? We have five children. Count them, five. And I'd say, I know, but I just feel like the Lord is going to call us to adopt. Because there was this thing that happened inside of me when I said, okay, God, every child needs a mom and a dad, and my kids need a dad more now than ever. There was something that happened when I spoke those words. And I thought, God, every child needs a mom and a dad. And he started to really do something with that and marinate it inside of my heart. And throughout the years of our marriage, I just kept saying to Dan occasionally, you know, I think one of these days God is really going to call us to adopt. And he would always say to me that same thing. And there was one time I brought it up. We were potty training Carson and doing driver training with Nicole and everything in between. And I said, but hey, if we can do all of this, we can probably do anything. And he said, we have five kids. <laughs> But a couple years ago, he said to me one morning, he said, Marie, you know, I do feel the Lord speaking to my heart about adoption. And I hadn't even asked him recently because I didn't want it to be just this thing that I kept asking about that he finally said yes to. I wanted it to be something that the Lord was speaking to his heart too. And, 
you know, I still had that expectation that when he said yes, it would all just happen and life would be beautiful. But right around that same time was when my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer. He lived for only eight months. After he died, my mom sold her house. She ended up moving in with us for a few months before her new house was ready. It just was like one thing after another, and I knew that this was not the timing to pursue adoption. And I said, God, what is going on? Because I thought we would actually be able to do something once Dan finally said yes. But now he finally said yes, and here we are waiting. But I just felt like the Lord was saying, Marie, there's purpose in the waiting. I said, okay, I'll trust you. And so it was a year this July that we officially submitted our application with Bethany Christian Services to adopt. And, you know, when we were doing kind of like the discovery process and deciding, okay, would we adopt domestically or internationally? And I started to hear some of the statistics and think about what they were saying that it just hit home to me that we had to adopt internationally. Most oftentimes, kids in other countries, when they hit 15, they're kicked out of the orphanage and they live on the streets. And I was looking at my own kids who were close to that age range, three of them, and thinking, God, they can't even get their dishes in the dishwasher. How would they ever live on their own? With no one to tell them, I love you, I believe in you, God has got an amazing plan for your life, and you are capable of anything. How would they do that? So we knew that we wanted to adopt internationally, and we also knew that we were not going for a baby. 95% of kids that are waiting to be adopted around the world are older than five. And we knew that we wanted to adopt one of them. Bethany Christian Services has this list every year, 400 kids that are waiting around the world that they want to place in one year. They have this goal of placing them every year, these are kids with some kind of special needs, but honestly, once you hit five, you're considered special needs. Your age does that to you alone and makes you far more difficult to place. And we said, we want one of those kids off that list because we know what it's like to be looked at differently. And our hearts were broken for those kids, and we said, we can make a difference for one of those 400. And so I think right about this time last year, we were submitting our official home study, and as soon as that went to South Africa, that was the country that we were matched with, they said to us, we want you to look at that list of 400 and pick one or two kids, maybe three that you'd like some information on. And I said, I didn't think adoption worked like this. I thought you just gave me a referral and told me who you thought would be best. And they said, no, we want you to pick. So we're looking at these kids, like 12 or 15, that were from South Africa. And I'm thinking, God, I don't feel like you're telling me anything about any of them, and how can this be? Because I had been looking at that list for months and, you know, seeing all these beautiful faces and these bright eyes and these, these children and thinking, I can't even imagine, God, who you have for us. But I didn't feel like he was saying that it was any one of those kids on that list. And, and we just kept praying. And I said, okay, I think we just need to wait and we just need to keep praying. But on December 18th, there was this face of this little boy that popped up on the list. And I called Dan at work and I said, I know you're at work, but you have got to stop what you're doing and look at this little boy because there is no doubt in my mind, this is our son. And so Dan jumped on the list and he felt it too, and I emailed our caseworker right away, but there was this huge lag because everybody was going on Christmas break. It was a week before Christmas. Um, our, the office here was closed down, and then the office in South Africa takes like a two-week Christmas break. And so by the time we heard anything back, it was late January. And we were thinking, oh my goodness, somebody else could already be in the process of adopting him, you know? But we were just praying and believing that God had this child for us and um, bought this little stuffed animal for him last Christmas, just believing that this was the child that God meant for our family. And so in February, we, we received the preliminary approval to adopt him from our agency, from the partner agency in South Africa, or some other agencies there. And then we started the whole process of, you know, American paperwork and the government and all of that, and received our referral in, in late May and got our court date for July. We traveled in July. We were there for about six weeks. And, you know, we think about it so often, just like kind of recounting how this has been. We've only been home for six weeks with our son. And, 
just thinking about those first moments when we met each other, you know, and the anticipation of that, and, um, you know, when he sat on my lap and I held him for the first time, that this was my son. And all those times that felt like a delay and all those years that I waited for Dan to say yes and then all that time that happened afterwards, God used all of that to bring us to the place where we were right then. And it has been one of the most beautiful things that I think I've ever been a part of in my entire life to watch this process unfold and to see the love that we have for him that he has for us. You know, when... We sent a photo book to kind of introduce our family and tell him about our world and all of that. And when he saw the picture of our family, he said, I always wanted a big white family, and that's exactly what I'm getting. <laughs> you know, that it wasn't just about this child that we had prayed for, but it was about what he had asked of the Lord. And God didn't miss it. And if you need any encouragement to know that he hears every one of your cries and that not one of your prayers will ever go unanswered, think about the prayers of a little boy at the bottom of the continent of Africa and what he asked God for for almost nine years of his life. And the way that God took our family and the way that he put us all back together and the way that he put us all as one. And you know, I think that in this process of adoption, the Lord really brought it home to me that this is how he feels when someone comes to know him for the first time. The love that I have for this little boy doesn't even touch the love that God has for you. And the love that he has when someone experiences him for the very first time. I don't know where you are with the Lord. I don't know what you came in here with, but I know what you can go out with. I know that you can go out with more of him. More of him than you came with. I want that for me, and I want that for each one of you. Because he's writing a redemption story over your life that you can't even imagine. He's not done with you yet. He's not done with these circumstances. And you might be walking through something really hard. These people that were making this choice to rebuild this temple, it was not going to be easy, and they were discouraged. But he made them a promise. He told them that he was going to be with them. He told them that it was going to be beautiful, and he was going to give them peace. Whatever he's asking you to do, wherever he's asking you to walk, he's going to go with you. And I can't wait to see what he has in store for our lives over this next year. Where will you be next October? What are you believing for him to do? I just want to pray with you as we close out our time together.